All right, hello everyone. Let's get this event started. Uh, I'm Gabriel Metcalf, CEO of the Committee for Sydney. Welcome to today's edition of Committee for Sydney Live. Uh, to start, I want to acknowledge uh, elders, past, present, and emerging. While we are meeting online and you may be in a different part of Sydney or a different part of the world, I am on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people who occupied this part of the Sydney coast. Today, we are going to hear from Dr. Rebecca Huntley, one of Australia's foremost researchers on social trends. She will be drawing on her new book, How to Talk About Climate Change in a Way That Makes a Difference. Climate change is a central focus for the committee, as it must be for everyone who is involved with policy on the future of cities and the future of the economy. Um, I can share that moving to Sydney from America, there are so many things, very, very many things, where Australia is far ahead of America. But climate change, unfortunately, is not one of them. So if you are like me, uh, keenly interested in the question of what it is going to take to change the discussion um, and to unlock the political stalemate here, um, then uh, it's, uh, it's very exciting that we're going to hear from somebody who has at least part of the answer. Rebecca Huntley is an author, broadcaster, and commentator. She is currently head of Vox Populi Research. I probably didn't pronounce that correctly, but she can she can fix it. For nine years, she was the director of the Mind and Mood Report, Australia's longest running social trends report. She is the author of numerous books, including Still Lucky, Why You Should Feel Optimistic About Australia and Its People. Today, she will be talking about her new book on climate change, which has been described as an essential guide to understanding ourselves and each other as we face the climate crisis. So the way this works, um, she will uh, make her remarks. Then we will have a discussion. Um, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A app on Zoom. I've already received a bunch of questions via email, so I will manage all these and sort through it and uh, do my best. Um, Rebecca, thank you very much. Take it away. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for the Committee of Sydney for inviting me to speak today. I'm, um, I apologise for the echo. I've found a little corner of um, Town Hall in Sydney to do this uh, webinar with you. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what, to start, to, to what brought me to climate change, because um, uh, it's been a relatively recent development in my career. So I've been a social researcher about, for about 15 years and undoubtedly, unsurprisingly, over that time as I've canvassed and sought to understand how Australians feel about, you know, our nation, its economy, our society, environment and climate change has been something that's come up at different periods of time. So obviously it came up very much leading up to the 2007 election, around the time of the carbon tax and various other kinds of things. So it's been there in my suite of issues that I've explored as a researcher. And certainly from a personal level, from somebody who is you know, interested in progressive politics and policy, and that's been a you know interest of mine my, kind of my whole life. There was absolutely no doubt that I was one of those people who believed climate change was happening, believed the experts as somebody who's um, uh, you know had a university education and understands what it means to be an expert. So believed the experts on climate change, believed that climate change was being caused by humans, believed that it was an urgent issue, and believed that, that, that government should do something about it. So if I had been answering any of the surveys that I had been responsible for drawing up over that 15 years, I would have ticked all those things um, and been in, you know, counted in the category of people concerned about climate. A little bit more than that, I would say that I did think about climate change when I voted and I tried to do the right thing in my home and in my day-to-day -day life in terms of climate change. But what's clear to me now um, uh, is looking back the reality of climate change um, was not, and the, the full understanding of what it means for our society and the world was not something that had quite yet um, penetrated 
um, to the core of my worldview and also to um, to the way that I saw the world in a sense. So there were moments over the last couple of years before you know before the last couple of years where I had twinges, I suppose, emotional responses to climate change rather than intellectual responses. One of them was when I took my my husband and I took our then five-year-old daughter to the Barrier Reef and we went snorkeling, which is um, something I encourage every Australian resident to do. Uh, and I remember we, you know, part of that trip was also to see the impact of climate change on the reef. And as we were snorkeling and I looked at my daughter, I kind of thought, oh, I wonder whether she'll be able to do this with her daughter in 20 or 30 years time if he ever decides to have a child. We know a lot of young people are reconsidering having children because of climate change. Um, so there were kind of moments like that, but, but really the, the turning point for me emotionally rather than intellectually on climate change was the students' climate strike. And one morning watching images from the student climate strike, watching um, those young people not that much older than my 12 year old, kind of collectively um, beg older generations to do something about securing some kind of livable future for them. I really had a kind of significant emotional response to that. That meant that my intellectual appreciation of climate change matched up with a kind of ethical, you know, and emotional response. And from that point on, really, not only have I made a lot of changes in my life, I've also decided to dedicate my professional life to understanding, uh, to a deeper and better understanding of how people, why people respond to climate change the way they do in Australia and how any organisation of any kind that's serious about doing something about climate change can better communicate with the Australian population. While there was this emotional response to climate change triggered by the children's climate strikes. There was also, a, a, I suppose, an intellectual um, greater focus on climate change after the election result of last year. So as, as many people would know, there was a little bit of you know, media leading up to that election saying that people, voters were really concerned about climate change and it was gonna be the climate change election. Of course, see that's not exactly how it turned out in any way. And that led a lot of pundits and commentators to say, well, you know, all of these surveys that said that people care about climate change, want governments to do something and all the rest of it, well, they're just rubbish. Um, and I would be the first person to say that, that the methodologies that we use in quantitative research to measure views and to also measure behaviour are certainly not perfect. We could do a whole hour on that. I do believe that people care about climate change. You know, the majority of people in Australia care about climate change and the environment. They just don't necessarily connect their, their vote to being the most effective way to do anything about it. And that has been because there's been a significant erosion in the trust that people have, that politicians are gonna do the right thing. There's gonna be a narrowing of focus as we begin to vote. And you know, that, to make a conclusion that the last election means that people don't care about climate or the environment would just be just utterly simplistic. But what it did say to me is that we need not only better ways of measuring how people feel about climate and what they want to do about it, we need to have a better understanding of what kind of advocacy and messaging works best with the kinds of groups in the community that care vaguely about climate, but see, it, see climate change and the environment as completely um, divorced from the things that matter to them day to day. So it was that stage um, that I started to look for more effective tools around the world that are used to measure climate change and um, arrived at um, a, a thing called the Six America Study, which comes out of Yale University. Actually, the very famous and very old school of forestry um, for people who know a bit about really early um, American environmentalism. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, it's, it's quite a large and an interesting program, the Yale um, Climate Program. And so if you go online, you can find out all the incredible stuff that they do in terms of measuring attitudes about climate change. And they've had what's 
we describe in the research business as a segmentation. Segmentation has been active for about 12 years and what it does is it divides the American population kind of neatly into six different kinds of um, attitudinal and behavioural groups. Everything from what they described as the alarmed, so people who are alarmed on climate change, to people who are dismissive, so which is, would be another word that we would use for deniers. And um, what the Yale program does is it segments the population, it measures any changes in those segmentations over time, and it and both um, the program, but also the broader advocacy movement in America, um, the environmental and climate change movement, use that often use that segmentation as a way to really focus their messaging and focus their advocacy and campaign work to try and understand, well, who are we really trying to, are we just trying to make the people who are already on board more anxious? Are we trying to mobilise them to do things? Or are we trying to shift the views of people who are generally concerned about climate but not paying much attention? So it's really been a very useful tool. We went to, flew to, it's been like a very strange thing to, it's like a world away, but I, I flew to America last year to spend some time with the program and um, with all the academics there and were, was very convinced that we needed something quite similar in Australia. And there have been some similar studies done in academia in Australia like that, but um, we're, we're about to, um, and out, you know, we've, we have been running that segmentation um, in Australia and it will be well um, socialised by the end of the year, well shared with the community. I'd love to come back and tell you a little bit about um, that at some stage. So the election last year made me realise that um, it's we need better research tools and we need more that to to sharpen uh, the focus on messaging. One of the very difficult and Gabrielle and I were talking about this just before I started. One of the really difficult consequences of using a kind of segmentation like that is you realise that what convinces one group turns off another and that we actually need different kinds of um, arguments, different kinds of emotional appeals, potentially different kinds of media, um, uh, different kinds of people speaking in, those me in that media to convince people to do the kinds of things that all primarily, and it's not, this is not the only thing that's needed in climate action, primarily encourage people that we need to make the transition to renewable energy away from fossil fuels in Australia far faster than we are. And that's um, now both, that's not just a political task at every level of government, it's a task of every organisation, public and private and civil society. So we're at a point where there is just no, no one effective argument and no one effective pathway, pathway to bring about the change within the time we have allocated. So, one of the things that comes out extremely, um, really clearly in the Yale segmentation, really clearly in any um, equivalent ever done in Australia, and um, you know, I don't want to um, share too much information about the, the segmentation that we're in the process of developing, but we'll come out in that, is the biggest determinant of how you feel about climate change, or one of the main ones is your political affiliation. So not necessarily your understanding of science, although education is pretty important, not necessarily your gender, although there is a little bit of a skew that women are a bit more concerned about men, and not necessarily what generation you come from, although if you're a, if you're a young, well-educated woman living in the inner city, you're almost certainly concerned or alarmed about climate, but you know, there's, so there's some demographic um, uh, I suppose, cues within these segmentations. But the main one is, is political, and the main one in America is political. And that's because, and come as no surprise to people on this call, is that in, particularly in Australia and America, the politicisation of climate change has been something that has been, you know, consistently, um, you know, happening over the last 20 years, if not more. Um, and it has meant, it has been one of the many things that has stopped, um, you know, an effective um, policy and political consensus on climate action. Um, now, in the question time and in the discussion, we might want to explore why it is that Australia and America, 
where we have some quite different, you know, significant differences in how we approach policy issues and how our politics works and how our political system works, what, why we are united in this particular issue. Um, you know, some people might say, and I've heard many people say that it's entirely the role of the um, Rupert Murdoch's um, media reach in those two countries. And I, while I, I would never underestimate the impact of that on um, our political culture and attitudes, I, I feel that that's too simplistic a, uh, an understanding or appreciation of why that's the case. But there's absolutely no doubt, again, and you know, leading up to this work that I've done in the last two years and just reinforced by that, that we have to find effective ways to diminish the political polarisation around climate change because it's one of the biggest impediments to, you know, really to action. Um, it's probably naive to think that we can completely get rid of it, but um, we have to find ways to get around it or to, to mitigate it. Um, and so one of the, so I've been thinking, you know, the book is an exploration of, of many, many issues around climate. It, it looks at our emotional response to climate primarily. It looks about the, the limitations of just a kind of a science first, facts first approach to, to communicating climate change. Um, you know, I don't want to go, I don't want to, I want to, if you're interested in buying the book or buying it and sharing it with all your friends, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to give you too many spoilers. But let's face it: if if the climate science was going to nail the issue, then we would have nailed that issue already. But because the climate science is just so incredibly clear and has been so um, overwhelming for such a long period of time, so I'm really looking at the human response to a human caused problem and how we can how a better understanding of human beings and how human beings operate, understand on this issue can help us communicate on climate change. But one of the, one of the things that's really interested me about how we, when I'm thinking about, look, how do we, how do we break down this political polarisation around climate change and, and start new conversations is this notion of, um, climate brokers. So for those people on the call who are communications people or work in agencies that looks at how we talk to the community, they'd know the, the phrase, the messenger is more important than the message. And we're definitely there on the climate change question. Um, you know, that's a bit of a, it's a bit of a general principle for communications, but it's more important on, on climate change than communications generally. And that's because, and I see in my research all the time, is that they're very, they can, the climate script, you know, about emissions going up, warming the planet, temperatures going up, extreme weather, blah, 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 we've got to change or, you know, we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket, that, that kind of script. It's interesting to see in the groups that I do that people are quite familiar and bored with that script, right? They're kind of, even though they, they question the science or they question the impact of all of that on their day-to-day -day lives, that this is not news to them. So we've had at least 10 to 15 years of that um, story about why climate change is happening and what's at stake circulating. So I'm looking for ways constantly to find a way to penetrate people's resistance and boredom on climate and find new ways to communicate it in ways that make it feel urgent and relevant to people. And so in the research for the book, I came across some very interesting work done by a guy called Professor Andy Hoffman, originally comes from a business background from the United States. I think he'd been at the University of Michigan for a long time and he may still well be there. Um, and his focus is really on the intersection between sustainability and the business community. But he is also thinking about this notion of how we enrich the, the um, we diversify and make kind of more interesting the different kinds of people in our society who talk about climate to kind of disrupt people's sense of the climate script being familiar or, or feeling kind of distance from the issue of climate change. So he comes up with this notion of um, what he calls climate brokers. So these are people, he argues, aren't from the traditional uh, environmental movement or from the parts of, of civil society, 
where we expect people to be talking about climate. So climate scientists or, you know, celebrities, you know, who are very, you know, people like Leonardo DiCaprio, Al Gore, politicians from the progressive side of politics, or spokespeople from the environment movement. And so these are the kinds of people that we expect to hear about climate change from. And because of the nature of those people, we often, they, as, as good as they can be as communicators, they reinforce the idea that only certain kinds of people care about climate change. You know, people who live in cities, people who are progressive in their politics, people who are wealthy, people who are well-educated. And anybody that doesn't fit into those categories, well, they don't care about climate change and climate change isn't relevant to their life. It really helps too, to kind of position climate change as something that's only a concern for the elite that don't care about the bread and butter issues that affect everyday people. Which is of course utterly ridiculous because let's face it, um, when the worst effects of climate change happens, Leonardo DiCaprio will get in his private plane and go to a private island with some supermodels and be absolutely fine. And the poorer you are, the browner you are, the less um, economically stable you are, the worse climate change will be for you. We're seeing that already now with COVID and we saw it um, and we will see it in climate. We're seeing it now in the Torres Strait and various other kinds of places. So what Andy Hoffman's notion of climate brokers um, brings to the fore and what I'm really interested in in the work I do ongoing about who are the most effective messengers on climate change is climate brokers um, straddle straddle the world of climate advocacy and another world that we wouldn't normally associate with climate advocacy. And they're able to effectively bring climate into audiences where um, they would, you wouldn't already expect climate change to be talked about. Um, he, so one really interesting um, area, um, and it's been particularly, um, you know, it's particularly interesting and fascinating area is the role of the insurance agency, the insurance industry in talking about climate. They frame it entirely in terms of, you know, future risk um, and exposing our world to future risk and creating essentially an un uninsurable world. So there have been some very interesting um, spokespeople from the insurance industry talking about climate change, not something you'd expect from anybody in the insurance agents in the insurance industry having worked with them in the past, but can be incredibly effective. He talks too about the role of faith leaders around the, around the world in talking about climate and talking about climate directly to their um, to their communities, to their faith communities. Now, of course, a lot of the progressive churches have had a long history of, of being advocates against, you know, nuclear weapons, against environmental protection, as this kind of whole notion of being stewards of um, God's creation. But what's not known quite as well is that, you know, every single religion, progressive or not, has made, made really strong statements around climate change, including a collection of evangelical churches in the United States as well. So it's not just that progressive religions are speaking out about this, but religions of all kinds. And again, that kind of disrupts this idea that, um, you know, that climate is only something that people who are kind of godless heathen lefties, you know, are concerned about. So, at, so I, I raised the issue of climate brokers and I'll, I'll finish now because I think there's going to be lots of, of questions. So I raised the issue of climate brokers because at this stage of the conversation, um, and I've used conversation advisedly on climate because most of the time it isn't a conversation, most of the time it's a kind of a, you know, mud wrestle on social media and in our, in our you know, politics. And for the rest of the time, for most of us, we're very hesitant about raising climate change with our friends and family and colleagues because we never should not quite know whether we're going to upset people or it's become a kind of, can be an unspeakable topic in many ways. It's not really a conversation, I don't know what it is, but at this stage of the, of the climate change, um, at this moment in time, the, the biggest challenges we have are about making people who are not already highly concerned and alarmed about climate change. We, our, concern is, our, our, our task is to make them connect 
if not climate change, but the solutions to climate change, to the problems that, and the issues that already exist in their life. To find new and surprising spokespeople, so climate brokers who are able to speak beyond the concerned and the alarmed about climate change in a way that makes seems relevant and relatable to the people that they're talking to. So we absolutely need to make sure that um, new, new and interesting voices emerge in the climate discussion. And we need to also build the confidence and embolden Australians to believe that this issue, which seems to have flummoxed, vexed and disrupted our politics since 2009, um, is something that is solvable. It is solvable. It's solvable because we now have the technology. It's solvable because um, it, it's really just a question of, um, of uh, determination and will. Um, and I'm beginning to think more and more that we need to mobilise every different part of civil society to drag those, to drag our political class to the table to really find a way to break through this very damaging politicisation of climate change. Um, the change is, I don't think, going to come primarily through our political leaders, but through our leaders in corporate Australia, our leaders at local government level, our leaders in all kinds of professions, in the investment community, um, and in and amongst, you know, for want of a better word, ordinary people recognising that doing something about climate change is doing something about cost of living. Doing something about climate change is doing something about the welfare and safety and security of their children. Doing something about climate change is means doing, doing something about generating jobs. Whether you call that climate change or you call that about energy transition, whatever language you use for different groups of people is kind of irrelevant. The, the outcome and the action are pretty much clear, which is that we need to make this transition sooner rather than later. Um, we've got the capacity to do it, we've got the technology, whether we've got the political will is a separate question. Um, and like I said, I think the politicians' hands need to be forced on this question. So it's now 11.28, so time for as many questions as you want to throw to me or, or um, discussion and response to it. Yeah, great. Thanks. Canvassed in that um, 25 um, minutes or 30 minutes or so. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Really interesting. Okay, first question. The Yale um, study segments American attitudes on climate change into six groups, I guess more or less on a, on a ladder of increasing or decreasing concern. Yes. Does the Australian public fit into the same categories or is it different here? Um, no, it's pretty much the same. I don't want to, again, I'm, I'm keen to come back and tell you all about it. There's the biggest category, both in America and Australia, is concerned, and that's up to 30%. I mean, I, I, I think there could be an interesting secondary segmentation in that concerned group about people who are concerned and but don't speak about climate change, don't see their vote as like, kind of like paralysed, concerned and paralysed. And there would be a group in there who are concerned and feel a bit more empowered and active. So I think that there are probably subgroups within larger groups. It would make people happy to know that in any segmentation that has been done in the United States and Australia, that people who would describe them, who we would describe as deniers, are less than 10% of the population. They're anywhere between four and eight percent. They're very, very small. Yeah. Um, the, the larger the challenge is not denialism in the community, the challenge is disengagement. The challenge is people who are like, this is too big a problem. If the people whose job it is to solve this problem can't solve it, don't ask me to solve it. So there's a significant group who are disengaged. There's a group who would describe themselves as doubtful, doubtful about whether we've got the technology, whether we can do it, and a bit doubtful about how bad it's going to be. They're like, oh, is it really going to be that, that bad? And there's another group who would describe themselves as cautious. They want to make the transition. But they're, again, they don't have the confidence that we could do that as swiftly as we need to without losing a lot of jobs and you know, our energy system being disrupted. So, that, so in a sense, the media's fascination with denial 
and continuing to do, and I've done my fair share of Q&A panels with denialists and all the rest of it, is that's not the question. The question isn't denial. The question is, can we do, you know, how quickly can we do it? How, how serious should we take the science? Everybody takes the science. Everybody believes the science, whether, whether, but whether they believe the worst projections, like the level of risk and the level of, of whether the things that are happening now are connected and how quickly we can make the transition. That's where the argument is. And that, that is the case both in Australia and in America. But the thing that I think would, would unite America and Australia, and this is where the Murdoch press plays a role, is that the, the, the articulation of denialist views in politics and in the media in Australia and America, give people a perception, the community perception, that there are more denialists in the community than there actually are. And there's actually research on this. When you say to people, what percentage of the population do you think deny climate change? They'll put it at 20 or 30%. Whereas, like I said, it's in single figures. Why do they think it's that big? Because there are so many powerful people in our media and in politics airing these views. So if we gave it, if we gave, if the Murdoch press gave people who denied climate change 4% <laughs> of airtime with or you know, column inch space, then that might be an accurate reflection of the reviews in our community. But of course they don't. So that's one of our big challenges, both in America yeah. and here. Rebecca, there's um, a, a, a tactic that climate advocates use, and I, I've done this a lot myself, um, where we try to talk about all the positives of taking climate action, grow future yeah. industries, and yeah. it's going to be great. Um, yeah. Some people suggest that that is actually backfiring because it's just not credible that there would be no sacrifice made. And in fact, when you look at um, the, the previous example was always World War II, but now COVID is a really interesting example. Oh. Pe sometimes people seem very willing to make sacrifices for yeah. uh, other people. Um, yeah. So do we need to be, can, can, we, can we say that climate action might involve some sacrifice or do we have to say that no, it'll all be positive? No, it's a really good point. We cannot be Pollyanna-ish about this. We, first of all, we have to acknowledge what's at stake. There is loss and risk, right? There is loss and, you know, while I, while I wouldn't want to sit down and read every single page of the uninhabitable earth to it. <laughs> Anybody ever read that book? Well, I, I wouldn't suggest if you had somebody in your life who was like wanted to engage in climate change tentatively, I wouldn't suggest giving them that book. But nobody gets motivated if there isn't something at stake. If there, if there isn't something that they will lose and if there isn't um, risk in inaction, right? So we do have to articulate that clearly because we have to have some credibility. And again, I don't think that people think that there isn't something at stake. What they tend to do is they tend to minimise the risk and they tend to push the, 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 the horizon of when that will happen out, and that's a problem. Um, and we can't just kind of say, oh, it'll all be fine. This is kind of this, this techno optimism, which is that, you know, somebody will, and it's a kind of false hope that somebody will just kind of, you know, like I say in the book, Elon Musk and Bill Gates will get together and invent something, which means we can all kind of keep living the life that we're, we've been living. So, um, and so I don't think we can do that either. Um, and in fact, you're exactly right. If people feel that, if people have a very clear idea of what's at stake and where we want to head, their capacity for um, sacrifice, some sacrifice and some behaviour gain, if it is shared by everybody, right? If it, it's not just, if it's shared by everybody, is bigger than we imagine. And if there's gonna be one outcome in Australia from COVID, and I don't wanna make any predictions because we're still in it, does anybody in Victoria, my heart goes out to you, but even, in, even everywhere in Australia, is that we can change um, our lives based on concern for people who are vulnerable and concern to protect the things that we value, our health system and our general well-being. And overall, even though there's 
you know, some dissenting voices, overall, the community are doing the right thing. The insidious part of COVID, of course, is that all you need is 0.0.3% of people not to do the right thing, and you've still got a problem. But I, overall, and I don't know what other people would say, overall, you look around and people are social distancing and doing the right thing and staying at home and being careful. And even in places like New South Wales, wearing masks, even though they're not required. So we can do it, um, but we need really clear rules, clear, good leadership and support for our, the most vulnerable in order to be able to do it. And that sense of shared sacrifice, that sense of shared sacrifice. Um, Rebecca, I have so many questions that are very political yeah. that are coming in because this is a very political topic, but um, yeah. some are asking about the, the case of the UK, which is, is a yeah. really interesting counter example because of course yeah. it's, it's the most culturally similar perhaps, certainly yeah. institutionally similar to Australia. And it's just really significant that the Tories are now a party of climate action um, exactly, and the Murdoch so media has always been powerful there. So exactly, and the Murdoch, and they have income inequality, and rich people have more power, and um, et cetera, et cetera. What is what is what are the lessons of that for a place like Australia? It's a really good point, and I've I've been having this. I've been thinking about this, and as as somebody who isn't an historian or isn't an, an economist who's across how the a British economy works. But I know enough, and I've been kind of anybody on the call that could have more to, to add to this. I mean, I remember that the, the big political fights over coal um, and fossil fuels in, in the UK happened in the 70s, and they were industrial fights, right? So they were industrial fights that weren't about energy transition. And largely, um, the Conservatives won, the unions lost. But I wonder whether the kind of the intense politics of fossil fuels, which still exists in Australia and America, were kind of exhausted in the 70s. You know, the fossil fuel industry, I don't think has quite the, the power in UK politics or quite the social and cultural power that it does have in Australian politics. I think we can't underestimate that you had kind of a very clear articulation of a concern around climate change from Margaret Thatcher and relative consistency from conservative leaders on climate change from that point on. So you didn't, as a, as a conservative leader, you never felt like you were going out on a limb on climate change, like you were gonna lose your job if you, <laughs> you went up on a limb on climate change. So that probably, you know, it, it, it's still a big deal in conservative politics today to go out on a limb on climate change. I mean, we've seen that in New South Wales with the Environment Minister, Matt Keane. I mean, he's done an extremely good job, but every time he speaks out really strongly on climate, I think I get a little bit worried about his, you know, the, the safety of his pre-selection because that's been, that's been the story of the last, 10 to 15 years, pretty much for both sides of politics as well, for the Labor side as well. So I wonder if that sense that you speaking out on climate doesn't mean risking your job in the Conservative Party in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and, and like I said, this kind of patriotic attachment to the fossil fuel industry doesn't quite exist in the electorate in the UK. So this is very speculative because I've thought about it. So when people say oh, it's all the Murdoch media and it's all about power and inequality, I said, well, yeah, but it, that's not happening in the UK. So I'd be fascinated if anybody else had any of those kinds of um, suggestions yeah. to make yeah, around that. Or alternatively, whether the big divider, and we were talking about it before, is really kind of Brexit and immigration, that that becomes the thing that, 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 that becomes the totemic political polarization question and it isn't on climate right place. somebody's surely surely you have an academic colleague out there who has done amazing work on the political sociology of conservative parties in yeah, cross-national perspective and we'll find yeah. them because yeah, yeah. um yeah it's, there's all in europe there are many conservative parties that are uh parties of climate action Absolutely. Um, so yeah okay yeah, lots it, of questions even quite populist governments as right. well, like ones that we would characterize as almost on the populist spectrum. Right. 
Yeah. Okay, lots of questions that are, I'm, I'm gonna group as looking for some practical tips about how to sure. talk about climate change. Um, somebody asked about how do I do it with friends and family who, who are yeah. skeptical. Somebody asked, how much should we be focused on big targets like 100% renewable energy versus specific steps? How much should we be talking about societal changes versus personal changes? So one way or another, a lot of, a lot of interest in advice on how to, how to talk about climate. Yeah, I mean, the thing I, I talk, the book I say is a kind of, guide to practical guide to talking about climate change but but really what it is is it's trying to get you to understand why people who probably aren't like you respond to climate change what what psychology tells us about that what the psychological studies do what the social research studies do and then it it in each of the chapters i talk to a, a different kind of climate communicator and get some real thoughts from them about how they manage their emotions and how they talk to people and what angle they take and those those case studies are taken from around the world and then in the final chapter i give them just basically general principles that i think work but look to go to the point of how you talk about it with friends and family or people you know i just have to and i admit in the book i find it hard i find it easier to get i would find it easier to get up at a in front of 500 climate deniers and talk about climate change than I would be to talk about it with my mother. <laughs> because, or my mother or my sister, because I feel like if I, if I talk to them about climate change and the things that I'd like them to do in their life, that they might think that I was judging them. <laughs> this is the nature of, of, of relationships, complicated relationships between families. I have done it though. I have I have said to them, particularly I've had conversations with them about, you know, it's not really gonna you're not gonna lose much if you change if you change the investment mix of your superannuation fund to divesting and go completely away from fossil fuels. It's not gonna make much of a difference, you know, for you. But I've had those conversations. So they're tricky, you know, they're tricky conversations because you feel like you might set off a landmine. I suppose the first, and then even harder, sometimes I've thought about whether I raise it with, um, I've got three kids, whether I raise it with mothers and fathers in the schoolyard, and then you think, what if they think I'm nuts, and then their kid doesn't want to play with my kid. So you know what I mean? You feel like having these conversations can be tricky. I think, I think the best thing is really not to talk, is to listen at the first start about why people feel the way they do about climate change. And certainly in the more and more of the work I do, I don't ask people how they feel about climate change. I ask them what they don't like about the climate change conversation. Like, oh, what is it that puts you off talking about it? Or when you hear somebody, what makes you annoyed? So to really understand what the points of resistance are. And then, you know, to tell you the truth, one of the things that I find really useful and I'm, I, is I get, I want people, well, I, don't, well, I, well, I absolutely take your point that we, we can't, present a completely rosy picture about, you know, everything's going to be fine. There are some pretty exciting things that are happening in Australia in relation to renewable energy and relation to, um, you know, environmental and climate progress. And I like to talk about those issues with people um, to give people a sense of possibility. And I think often when something really incredibly positive has happened, um, that and already happened rather than going to happen then that can give people a sense of oh you know we can find a way through this and 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 they give, gives people a sense of confidence and so sometimes i i mention those kinds of things like for example the battery in the south australian desert that was such a controversial thing um gosh that's working well and the conservative government in south australia has no intention of of shutting that battery down it is incredibly effective it is incredibly profitable and um, you know I often will send people a link to that and so just to get a bit of a sense of, of, of a little po small positive spark which makes people think oh this probably isn't as difficult as we can imagine it could be and in fact today I just saw a piece that Julie Gillard did talked about um, the carbon price and saying well it actually did work and we are capable of doing this so um, so that's what I try and do. I recognise that it's difficult. I recognise this is not going to be one conversation. It's a series of conversations feeling out 
how people, what, what resistance people have, whether they see it's connected to their lives, dropping in little bits of ideas. It's, a, it's an ongoing conversation that you can have with different people. Um, and there are lots of, you know, the, the other thing I collect is examples of, of interesting organisations that have started those conversations amongst their community. So um, people might not know that Tennis Australia has a very, very um, uh, out there climate policy they're really worried about the impact of climate change on tennis. <laughs> um, they really, and you know, they 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 know that that it's not going that that everything from you know the Australian Open or well, Australian Open might be indoors, um, but you know, it, all, people playing tennis outside may not be possible. You know, maybe actually quite a bit of a health hazard. So, Tennis Australia are trying to have a conversation about climate change with their members and their community. And so have a look at how they do it. You know, and this is, this is not a political organisation. This is a, an organisation based around a, a pastime. So have a look about, there were, there were so many interesting kind of starting points into the climate conversation. It doesn't have to be about climate change. It can be about something else that matters to people. For, for all of the, the parents at our school, it's about, whether the kids can play outside in the summer because of, you know, if there's too much bushfire smoke or it's so hot, they're all going to be inside. The last thing we want is our kids to be inside more. We want them to be outside. We want them to have, a, you know, a livable, wonderful, no matter what season it is, life. And so that, that can be a starting point. Um, a question about the bushfires. Um, <laughs> they they before every before covid made everybody forget about the bushfires <laughs> it felt like um a kind of apocalyptic potentially transformative moment certainly um, one thing i know is that the bushfires loomed larger in the minds of people outside of australia than Absolutely. they did in australia and Absolutely. um my 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 friends and family in america would were constantly calling to ask if i was all right people I know with family in the UK and America all had that same experience. It was on the front page of, uh, it, led, it led the TV news every night in other countries. So Australia was the subject of maybe more negative global attention than it had ever mm -hmm. been before because it wasn't yeah. necessarily sympathetic news coverage. It was like, it, it was like, hey, you guys have not good climate policy. Um, there, yeah. So it was, it was not sympathetic. Been. There was, is it, is it legitimate to use moments like that to try to accelerate the conversation on climate action or does that backfire because, because there's so much variability in natural events? Um, it's a great, and, it's a great and Yeah, is it a good, what, what's the right way to think, think about moments like that? Because presumably that will happen again. Yeah, we're in fact where somebody, somebody tweeted the other day that we're, where um, as we head more towards September, which is not that far away, we're in the beginning of October, that's kind of when the bushfires started last year. So we will still be, we'll have COVID and the bushfires overlap. I just can't, well, it means basically everybody will be wearing a mask for different reasons. So this is, this is something I've spent quite a lot of work on, like people's response to the bushfires and seeing quite a lot of research. I suppose the first thing I need to say is that a lot of the global research about the capacity for a particular weather event, whether that be a cyclone or a hurricane or a, you know, an incredible deluge of you know, these kind of rain bombs that have been created by, some, by climate change or, or wildfires. What is, the trans, what is the potential for an individual weather event to bring about a change in people's attitudes to climate change? So the, the research is mixed. It can move the dial, um, it can move the dial a bit, particularly with people who are already kind of concerned, it can kind of make them more concerned and move them to more the alarmed group. But if people are already disconnected from the climate issue and aren't connecting what's happening in our world today to climate, and they've also been affected by something devastating, saying, oh, this terrible thing that just happened to you is because of climate change, people will push back on that pretty bloody hard, all right? So um, it, it can have mixed effects, as you can imagine, on an already divided community. 
But I don't want to underestimate it because what's been very clear in all the studies that have been done is that these kinds of events can, can effectively mobilise enough individual community leaders to say, we need to do something about climate that is effective. So one of the things that has come out of the of bushfires is a very broad, under, broad recognition, and this is profound, that our First Nations people have been pretty good at fire management over time. They've got extraordinary, um, you know, depths of knowledge about how to do it, and that perhaps we need to draw on that ongoing in our fire management systems. So there's been a much better appreciation of that in these fires than, let's say, an appreciation of this connection with climate change. Now, that could be used by government and policymakers, that kind of appreciation in the community to say, well, let's actually do more of this. Now, that's going to have, if that happens, and it happens effectively, that's going to have good outcomes for a good environmental and climate change outcomes, even though it isn't necessarily a consequence of greater appreciation of climate change. But in the work that I've done on, um, on what the fires did to people's attitudes to climate change and the research I've seen, what it really did was it made everybody pretty much double down on their already existing opinions. And it, but it did make people who were already perhaps on the pathway towards being alarmed, it accelerated that. And I've met some of those leaders in the last couple of months and I think they're, they're new, new people, new people again who were a bit like me concerned and then suddenly like, oh no, this is something we need to do. Um, that being said, and there was just one final point on that. Um, the failure, and understandably, you know, I just I, don't, I want to use failure very carefully because this is such a hard area to do anything on. I think for, for myself and the movement, we thought the fires were such a clear message that we needed to do more on climate change. It just felt like it should have been a tipping point, that we underestimated the impact of the mainstream media and the Murdoch media and their effective social media presence. It's about arson, it's about bad bush, you know, bad management of undergrowth and it's about greenies. That narrative got nailed. Not because people were reading it in the newspaper, but seeing it constantly on social media and then and versions of that repeated on the nightly news and commercial TV. And, and that was incredibly effective. And why? And it was incredibly effective, not just because that was the dominant media narrative, but because we know psychologically that if people, if you give people an out, if you, if there is this devastating bushfire, which no bushfires across the nation, I mean, the numbers are extraordinary in terms of not just people killed, hectares burnt, you know, crops burnt, animals killed of all kinds, it's incalculable. If, if, if you're already disconnected from climate change and you see this and people are saying this is about, could this be about climate change or could this be about arsonists? You're going to say, oh, it's about arsonists because that feels more controllable, feels less confronting to think that it's about arsonists and greenies than it is about climate change. So you're going to take that cognitive safe way out. If it's given to you and it was given to the community by a very, very effective social media and mainstream media narrative, which says this isn't climate change. Mm. All right, this might be the last question. Um, it might be, some of my questions are a bit long, but hopefully they're interesting. No, really interesting. Um, let's talk about COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Many people have been commenting um, something to the effect of, what you just did on COVID, do the same thing now, but for climate. Yeah, um, that's right listen to the science, explain the issues to the public, ask for shared sacrifice, do specific things to take care of vulnerable, impacted segments yeah. of the population, you know, on and on, like everything you could want. Spend the mm -hmm. money it will take to solve the problem. Mobilize all the resources available. Um, so is there any way to harness the, um, the kind of, discovery of just how capable and competent the Australian government is um, in COVID for uh, a, different, a different political alignment around climate change? I think that I'm pretty positive. Um, my one caveat is that climate is a more kind of, it, 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 it doesn't feel quite as immediate as a pandemic. 
and it doesn't kind of, there aren't as many social cues around us that a pandemic is happening. Like we don't, every time we walk into a store to buy something, it's not, we're not reminded that there's climate change is an issue, right? But every time we go every buy a coffee, pick up our kids, we're being reminded it's a pandemic, it's a pandemic. So there are some different social cues. There is a, the, the nature of the crises are different. But the social behaviour and the collective social behaviour and the capacity of government to solve it are very similar. So, and more importantly, in a lot of my work, as you can imagine, the last three or four months has been about what does COVID mean for climate? The thing we've got is an, op <clears throat> is an opportunity to say, and there's a real opportunity to say, in order to, nobody thinks that we can go back to kind of how things were before, even if this is over by Christmas, which is very unlikely to be the case. I think there's a real capacity for our leaders to say, look, the pandemic has changed our world in, this, in these ways. It's made us more open to these things. How can we continue to behave in this way? And how can we work out what, how can we accelerate the things that we know we need to do, not only to recover economically, but to brace ourselves for anything like this in the future? So there's some really advocacy around that. So I think that we can find a way to make a really strong argument that action on climate, particularly in terms of the, of the massive, of the, of the transition to renewable energy, will be something that will be economically beneficial for Australia and help us when we next have to address any kind of crisis like this. So I'm, I'm largely positive while recognising that there are some real differences between the two crises. Um, and at the very least, anybody, any, any political leader or any community leader needs to hold the conservative governments to account about this. That if you are prepared to listen to health experts on COVID, why won't you listen to the, your own CSIRO and your own Bureau of Meteorology on climate? What is the difference? These are both crises that affect the economy, threaten people's lives. Why, why are you taking a different approach? That should be an art question that's continuously posed to conservative parties where there are significant climate deniers still holding those parties back. How, how does one pose those questions in a way that doesn't just get the answer of, oh no, we, we, like you say, nobody denies it or not very many people deny yeah. it, it's very small. They just say, oh yeah, we're already doing everything we should. Yeah, well, that, that's when you tell them that they're not. <laughs> I mean, you can't possibly say that you've got climate policy when you're saying we're going to have a gas-led gas economic recovery um, and that still means doing stuff on climate change. So, I mean, that's when you start to, that's when you have to get into the nitty-gritty a bit. But, yeah, I mean, that, that's when, I mean, I, I say that we have to keep holding politicians to account about this, but, again, I think that the, the, main, the main levers will be around, will be, kind of ring fencing politicians with all parts of society to say, we should do this, we can do this, we're already doing this, why aren't you doing this? Rather than necessarily just going head to head in that kind of very unsatisfying theater of politics, which is basically, you know, everybody just yells talking points at each other. Yep. <laughs> and it's a very, it's a highly, um, um, it's a highly unsatisfying way to, to talk about something as complex and important as climate change. But, you know, we've got to keep trying. All right. Rebecca, thank you for taking time from, I guess, Town Hall to um, share your thoughts. Um, yeah, really, really interesting and relevant. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. Everybody else, thank you for joining today, and we will see you at the next Committee for Sydney Live.